As I was sitting here, I thought I'd share a story that happened to me this morning. Um, I was driving down yesterday and got, uh, got here out at 6.30 or so last night. And I'm from Central Illinois. That's where Agrivisor is based out of. And I'm leaving here today and I'm driving to Columbia. I thought I was going to. And I'm going to hop on an airplane and I'm going to fly to Florida. Well, this morning when I got up, I had three beautiful daughters at home and a lovely wife. And I called her and I said, hey, can you believe it? On my flight, it's, it's snowing. She's like, yeah, yeah, I can. I said, I am so frustrated that it's snowing and I can't get, um, I said, I can't get to the, uh, the airport and I don't know if flight's probably going to be delayed. Now what am I going to do? She's like, yeah, yeah. Do you remember you have three children at home? And do you remember that it's also snowing here? And do you know the snowblower doesn't work? <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm going to go downstairs to my meeting. <laughs> So my risk, the risk in that is, is, you know, everything we do, we take risks. I should not have complained. I should have, I should have been more, more thoughtful of my situation. But um, real quick before we get started, I want to thank the Farm Bureau for letting us come. Excuse me one second. I do, uh, I do appreciate it. I do travel quite a bit and, and do kind of do speak on grain markets and other markets, commodities, and those kinds of things. Um, and it, it, uh, it is an interesting twist on what's going on right now. It is a game changer. Um, we have a lot of different variables out there that continue to put pressure on our farmers today. Those could be legislative. Those could be budgetary. Those can be um, just outside money, hedge funds, investment money, weather, seed. You're, the, everything that you guys do, you pretty much put the grain in the ground or you feed it but other than that, everything else is kind of at your mercy. You're, you're at the mercy of everything else, I should say. So there's a lot of risk involved in everything you do. So it is changing. It used to be, there used to be a time, remember, when, when the markets would move two, three cents, and that was a big day, right? Two, three cents, five cents. Oh man, corn market moved five cents today, huge day. Well now, we get huge swings, and there's a lot of volatility. For example, that volatility is about four weeks ago, I was sitting, um, we do a, a, a small radio show called a podcast where we talk about markets. Perfectly, it's 100% free. If you want to listen to it, go to agrivisor.com. It's there on the main page. Well, we were doing that show one day on a Tuesday. And the market, bean market, was up 24 cents. It was a big day for the bean market. And everybody said, well, what's the bean market up for? What's, what's going on? What's, what's the deal? Well, you might want to guess what it was. You know? South America weather, move the market 24-7. <coughs> so then Thursday, we're back in the same studio, doing the same show just two days later. The market's down 12 to 18 cents. The market's down 12 to 18 cents. 12 to 18 cents. You want to guess why it was down 12 to 18 cents? South America weather. Can it really change that drastic? What we're seeing is there's a lot of outside money coming in. It's been there for a while, and it's continuing to push this market. And you're seeing, in a time where there's not a lot of fundamental news, you'll see stories uh, that, that will spike the market. You'll see stories that are going to drop the markets. And as a risk manager, as, as you having the crop or the cattle or, or the commodity, you need to take advantage of those opportunities, take advantage of those spikes. And so we'll talk about that a little bit today. And so I did figure out where volatility comes from. I like to show this. Anybody seen this slide before? Okay, I do. I do enjoy the slide. Which one is the laser on? Okay. All right. So this slide kind of kind of spells it all. Well, okay. What this is saying: There's a gentleman here on the phone, and he's saying, "Hey, I've got a stock that could really excel." There's a guy behind him that's listening in, really excel, really excel, really excel. Turns into sell. So think of a pit in a frenzy selling. Just because a guy said one could really excel, all of a sudden it's selling. Selling down here. Well, there's a guy down here at the bottom, and he's saying, this is madness. I cannot take it anymore. Good buy. Well, goodbye turns into buy. So I think it's funny because it's, I have, I have, oh, no, it's no AT&T representatives, but I have AT&T as my cell phone service. So when I drive, usually if I'm in the country or visiting a farmer, I have no cell phone service. So I always think, you know, you guys go to work, Leave the, house, leave the house, market's up 25 cents, you come back, market's down 25 cents. What happened? Well, maybe it was some of that, right? 
So, all right, question for you. Who over the next three months thinks that our old crop corn is going higher? Just a show of hands. <coughs> higher. Oh, we got a couple. How about lower? Lower? How about sideways? Some sideways? Sideways is the easy answer. What about new crop, the December contract? You guys think it's going higher or lower? Who thinks higher? Lower? Oh, boy. Sideways. All right, all right. Who's sitting there thinking that's what you're up here? Tell me. <laughs> I always use that slide right there to pick how I'm going to talk the rest of the time. So, sorry, the bear's the one. So, sorry, bulls. We're going to be bearish. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about money. We'll talk a little bit on livestock. We'll talk about supply and demand in corn and soybeans. We'll touch on South America. And I know I'm the last speaker, so I'm going to... I'll skip through some slides as we go through because I have 45 wonderful slides that I can go through and point and talk about each one of them, but I don't want to do that to you today. So even before we get started, a lot of times there's never time to ask questions. I want to ask this question now. Is there something, what is on your minds as farmers, producers, that you would like somebody like myself to answer? And I don't have a crystal ball, so don't, don't, look, don't ask me a question of, Tell me what the high of the market's going to be. So I probably don't know that. But is there something that you've been hearing that you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound right? Or do you have any comments, questions, or thoughts? That way I can answer it now, or it might be in my presentation. Do I want to start? Yes, there it is. If we plant 99 million acres of corn, and it was said earlier, if we plant 99 million acres of corn, and as it was said, said earlier, a 150, 155 bushel harvest. Where do we go if we go ahead and get the rain? From a, from a, from a corn standpoint, corn prices, price. yeah. we're going to go lower. That'll put us, the, the, uh, that's the easy answer, right? Um, first question is, most people ask, so I'm, the, the first part of that question, what I usually come into is 99 million acres. Well, where are we going to get 99 million acres? So first, let's, let's look at that, and then I'll address your question and answer that. So I don't think we're going to have 99 million acres. I think we'll have about 96, 97 million acres, maybe 98. I think we get these extremes, and we get these analysts out there who like to write some crazy story that will push these markets one direction or the other. So you get a little bit of that. But um, you know, there are acres coming online in the Dakotas, corn acres. Mississippi, I was talking to somebody this morning at breakfast, but Mississippi, cotton acres are starting to switch into corn acres. Cotton acres are at a 27 year low. So you're starting to get cotton acres switch to corn. Cotton's a lot more labor intensive. As some of you in here know, corn isn't as labor intensive. So you get some of that. Also, the state of Alabama is looking to add corn acres, irrigation, those types of things. Um, so I think we'll have acres, but I don't think we'll have the 99 million. However, if we do have the 99 million, and we have a DC deal, Corn market could see four dollars. If we see a billion plus in carry, that is going to be extremely bearish. We've been tight for so long, the last couple of years, so long, right? Two years, so long we've been tight. But we really had been tight to a point where if we hit that billion mark, or if we hit over a billion, we're going to be extremely. It will be bearish. Now, I don't think we're going to see three dollars. I think it was 2009, August or September of 2009, we hit 297. That wasn't that long ago. But we've been in a rally pretty much ever since. I think what's going to stop that is money, outside money. Fund money will come in, you'll see buying opportunities, and they will buy, and they will push the market higher. Also, when we hit that $4 mark, you're going to see our import, our exports increase. You're going to see ethanol plants come back online. So you're going to see that usage start to pick up again right now. We've been in such a demand destruction from our corn market that has really started to push, that's, that's really started to have a negative attitude on the corn market. So it'll go lower, and I think it could be around that $4 mark. Long. Will cattle follow that? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's <laughs> I don't think, I think cattle, I honestly think if we did that, cattle will go lower. But I think with, with potentially what we have in, in exports and demand and those types of things, I think we will see the cattle market roughly stay in that 120 to 130 range. 
I don't see it going much below that 120. But I don't see it going much higher than the 130 either. I think that's a that's a range where we'll see that thing play out. Another question? You're thinking. Sure. You're thinking. Is there any truth that the USDA reports are going to be stopped? Are going to be stopped? Correct. No, they won't stop the USDA reports. They won't stop them. Now they may, there's, you know, talk of the extended hours and we shorten the hour, you know, we've got longer hours now and there's talk of bringing the hours back to normalcy to a more of a having a longer close. Mm -hmm. But then the question was, was when the reports come out, how do we, because that's the issue. When those USDA reports come out, they come out, and, and a lot of it, and most of you guys may not know this, and this is totally off of what I'm going to do, so I apologize, Kelly. But, <laughs> but what, those, what those reports, a lot of times, we've got computers set up with algorithms that are just looking at headlines. So if you watch the market, and you're sitting watching, and you've got a live feed, and that USDA report comes out, the first line comes across the newswire, and boom, market moves one way or the other. And it's a computer algorithm that's reading certain words, certain numbers that it's looking for, and it throws it in, and then it turns a buy or sell signal. So it creates all that volatility. It's really not fair because you can see a spike, and by the time you guys make the call to make the sale take advantage of it, it's already back down to normal. So it spikes, somebody's making it on volatility, some trader somewhere for the funds, and then it's coming back down. So that was the issue of these USDA reports are causing this, and they're causing that. But what we've seen in the last two or three reports is we've seen all that trade up to, all that hype up to, and I'm just as guilty of it. I love those reports. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to digest in those reports. It sounds sad, I know, that that's my life is reading these reports. <laughs> my wife and girls still don't know what I do. But I talk about them for weeks before, and then the market's already traded because everybody else is talking about them too. So then what happens is, Report comes out and everyone says, "Oh, okay, let's just go to work." You know, there's no more excitement, so you're starting to see a little of that. So, long story on the reports, but I don't think we'll we'll stop them altogether. They're they're important. They play a role. We have to have a we have to have some information to start with every marketing. Believable or not, you know, 166 yield. Who thinks we're going to get a 166 corn yield? Who thinks we're going to get a 150? 40? Who, is, who doesn't want to participate? <laughs> he brings to see it. All right. Fair enough. 120. Nation, nationwide, you think we'll be at that 120 level? Even after, even after the weather report today. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I don't think 120, I don't think 160. I actually think 140 to 145 is sort of roughly. This is kind of the idea that I, that I see from my little sample. <clears throat> Any other questions? Before we... Yes, sir. On, uh, on soybeans, he's, he's got one. On soybeans, uh, you said there's a, a five new acres coming out of the north, uh, Dakotas, and so on for corn. What is your prospect uh, for soybean acreage? for us this year, and uh, do you think we have more potential to expand soybean production for world needs than corn? So the question, so the answer to the first part of the question is, I think we'll have an increase of about 1 to 1.2 million acres of soybeans this year. Okay. And then the second question, ask me that again. Well, do you, do you expect uh, the demand for beans to continue to grow, I guess is what I'm asking, uh, like we have seen it grown in the last couple of years. I do see the demand continue um, in soybeans. Crush margins are phenomenal. Um, veg oil is important. I mean, there's, there's just so many things right now in so many countries that are, that are demanding the soybeans. So I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Um, now, the issue then comes with South America. South America is coming on board. They're going to have another record crop this year. So that's the thing. So again, going back to risk and managing the risk is we're seeing a lot of spikes because of weather talk in South America. But at the end of the day, they have, the largest, they have such a large amount of acreage that they're going to produce a good crop. Now, why I think soybeans will still become, be attractive here, even with that, them coming on board. Excuse me, can I do a glass of water, please? Sorry, um, but I think 
uh, going in with South America, their issues are logistics, right? And so we're going to run into some logistic issues. So with that being said, we're going to come right back to the United States for soybeans. And the talk is this year, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but the talk is by May, by May of this year, if our demand keeps at the same pace it is, by May of this year, we could potentially run out of soybeans in the United States, even with South America coming out. So yeah, the answer is yes, demand. Thank you so much, Gary. Don't let the news media see that. Don't let the news media see that? Drink water. Oh, I know, this is bad, right? Hold on. <laughs> if that's all you guys remember from my talk today, I don't know. That might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing, right? Depends on what I say. So you, you got the mic, sir. Um, does a traditional farmer here supposed to, or thought as, of having to sell their crops uh, at the end of the year for financial reasons or whatever it's forced on? I think, or am I wondering if uh, with the better uh, economic situation that farmers find themselves in now, if there isn't resistance at the farm level for letting their crops go at such low price? It's, I was wondering if you account for something like that or not. Well, it's interesting you, you mentioned that. And maybe, and we, um, as I've traveled, I've uh, been to Kansas. I was in uh, I was in Iowa throughout the entire state of Iowa speaking. I've been to the state of Illinois. I was out east in uh, Pennsylvania and in New York. And everywhere I go, and I'll ask the question in here too. I ask the question of who has old crop corn? On? And you get about fifty percent of the room to raise a hand. Now I don't ask how much. That's not what I. Mean. Well, the point is, is I think you've run into that, that guys don't have to sell right now. Economically, there's not a need to sell. So me, as a risk manager, talking to farmers and saying, hey, this is a good profitable level. Let's make those sales good profitable levels. Well, if you're not needing it, you know, there's, there's that mindset of, I don't really want to sell at this level. Because I think, too, some guys, and I'm not saying it's those in the room, but there are some farmers that think media says that there's not going to be a lot of corn oil. We're going to have 632 million to carry, and it could get lower, right? It could be lower. We could have real tight stocks. Mm -hmm. So if we had those tight stocks, corn prices are going to shoot through the roof. So why would I sell it now at 560 when I can wait and sell it at $10 when the market's <laughs> You guys laughed at $10. I had somebody actually tell me if corn was going to go to $20. <laughs> I've also had somebody tell me corn would be 250 again. And I always have to remember that 497 percent of the people in the world exaggerate. That's the only joke I have, guys. Uh, but I, I do think because of because of lack of, of need, there's been a lot a lot less selling. So I do think there's more corn out there in the country than what people are really saying. And I know certain areas, Missouri got hit hard with the drought this year. Southern Illinois got hit with the drought this year. So I know that there are areas and a lot of areas that had no corn at all. So I, I get that. But I think in Areas Western Iowa, there are other areas, little pockets in Illinois that had extremely good yields, and they're sitting on a lot of their corn. And so that's something to keep in mind. So what could surprise us at the end of the day is, you know, right now, if you look at the corn market as a whole, what do we have in the corn market? We've got 632 carry right now left, and or what they're saying right now. But I truly think that could be 750 to 800 million by the end of the day. My two reasons for that our ethanol and exports. Does anybody know when we were below a billion bushels in exports in corn? No one guess. It's a lot more fun when you guys participate. <laughs> <laughs> 1960? Did you say it, Doug? Sorry. So now you got no clue. 1977 was the year we were below a billion. Now we're at the lowest level of exports since 1971-72. But extremely low in exports. Why is that? We priced ourselves out of the market. We rationed ourselves out of the corn market from that from an, from an export world. Argentina, South America, you know, Brazil, Argentina, they have corn and they're willing to meet the, the demands of the world if they can. Now the issue is again logistics, and I'll talk on that. I've got a few cool slides up here that I want to show on the logistics side. The other side of that is ethanol. What happens with ethanol? Right now, ethanol has been very good, it's helped support corn prices. Um, you get the DDGs out of it, right? So it's a cheaper fee that's, that's valuable for, for livestock folks. But it, the ethanol plants haven't been profitable for the last 13 months. So you're starting to see those plants shut down. 
halt. We run, we're running about 83% of production. Last year at this time, we were about 97% of production. And each week, they report grind numbers. How much corn did they grind this week, last week in ethanol? We have to grind about 87 million bushels a week of corn to meet where the USDA has us pegged at that four and a half billion. 87 plus million bushels a week. We've only ground 87 million bushels a week twice since September 1st. This is the marketing year began. So you start, and every year, every, every week we miss that, it starts to lift that level. So those are some issues from, uh, from that standpoint. So when I start thinking corn, you know, maybe I'm starting to talk a little bit of a bearish story, but that's kind of what we see right now. Now, at the same time, there could have been somebody here last year, and I don't know who spoke last year. Was it you, Phil? Did, did you speak here last year? No. No. Whoever was here last year could have been saying, weather's going to be great. We're going to have corn prices are going to be three dollars, four, three and a half, because we're going to have the biggest crop ever. Well, we're kind of in that same story right now, right? We're talking good head, good, good weather. You hear a lot of animals, big acres, good yields. We're going to have the biggest crop ever. So, so it could very well change, and the prices could take off again, even without, just because of weather. So you've got that weather variable again that can change again, too. Questions? No? Yes, sir? Uh, do you favor cash markets, options, or hedges? Okay. Okay, excellent question. Question is, is, do I prefer cash market, options, or the futures market to hedge myself? I think as a farmer today, you have more opportunities to manage your risk in multiple ways by all of those. So if you were to ask me that question, I would say I use them all. So I, I diversify. Kind of like a, my background is in finance. I have a finance degree, and I was actually a financial advisor. I left the ag market, the agriculture industry, went to finance, and then came back with it. Um, but I just realized people are a lot nicer in the ag industry than they are in the ag industry. Um, but I, I, uh, I, when I, uh, it's all about diversification. So I think making cash sales at times are great. I think locking in floors at great le at levels like five sixty six dollars in corn, thirteen dollars in soybeans by buying a put is a phenomenal strategy. Now, you have to remember that if you buy a put, that doesn't mean you've sold your grain, right? So I think that's when the confusion gets. If you buy that put, that doesn't mean you've sold your grain. It means you've just locked in a price for that grain. So depending on what happens, if the market goes south, that put gains value to keep you at that $13 level. When you sell the beans at that lower level, you offset, get out of that put, and then you have the $13 sale. If it goes the other direction, you sold higher cash, so any loss you had in your put is made up on the cash sale. So really when you do that, you're locking in the price. So we use those a lot. We use future sales. I was talking to somebody last night. It's all about energy over here. Um, but I was uh, talking to somebody last night. We were talking about that in futures. And the thing that scares me with futures is with volatility of the market and margin calls, it can get behind, you can get behind really, really quick. So I, I backed away from the futures. But I think options, if you understand them, and you have someone that explains them to you very, very well, so you understand what you're getting into, I think those are a good place to go. I've even talked about, to some of you guys, about basis contracts. Because corn basis and bean basis is so strong right now, because of the demand and the not having it, lack of it, lock in. If you've got corn, lock in a basis contract. And then look at when you want to make that sale, sell that corn, then you can go, then go sell it. But at least you're allowed to get in basis because basis is pretty strong in this area, if I'm It's 40, 50 cents in corn in Illinois. I think it's about that here too, right? 40, 50 cents over, something like that. I know it depends on where you're at. But. So those are things. So it's a good question. I mean, so those are things that we look at. Or just straight cash sales. So, so. Now, the other side of that, though, with more, more marketing. So I'm kind of the bad guy because last year I was in a meeting. Weatherman came in. Was from Noah, and he told me a story. And he said he was talking. And he said, "You know what? Dry winter does not mean dry summer. Dry winter does not mean dry summer. Dry winter does not mean dry summer." He kept saying it over and over again. And all these statistics to back him up. I quickly realized that 107 percent of all statistics are made up on the spot. 
because I went through and did the rest of my talks from February on and told everybody we need to stop because the markets are going to go lower because the weather's going to be perfect. So, you know, so you get into that and then the markets are off. So what my, my point to all that is, is, you know, a lot of guys that, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about risk management or forward selling right now because what's happened in the last two years? What happened to the, what happened to the February price, your insurance price, versus harvest option? Five sixty-eight, seven and a half. So it's hard to get in the mindset of extra forward marketing or, or doing any risk management too because of those reasons. So find ways to lock in floors but give yourself outside potential. That's my risk management. Any? Okay. Any other questions? I think I've, I've covered my whole thing here, guys. I'll show you this chart, talking about the outside funds and money. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this, it's kind of a confusing chart here. But these blue lines are hedge funds. Hedge funds in the market, they can go long or short. Okay, so they can long or short the market. Red funds are the index funds. Index funds can only be long. They're either long or they're out. They do not short the market. Uh, and this is CCI index is what this is based off of. But what I'd like to show is, is right here. So if you look here, you can see there weren't a lot of red and blue on these, on this, on this right here, on the chart. But about 2000, all of a sudden blue started to spike, and then the red and blue really started to spike, and then we had the 08 incident, and then 09, and then we kind of ran up. But does anybody know why there may have been a spike right here? And if you were talking to me last night, you can't answer the question. Anybody have any ideas or thoughts? <coughs> what, happened? what happened in 2000? Equity market, stock market crashed, the bubble burst of tax. <coughs> Dot com companies no longer, no longer uh, as exciting and attractive, and a lot of them went bankrupt. So you saw the equity market really collapse. So you started to see this dive into the housing, but also in the housing <coughs> markets as well. And so that's kind of a trend that's continuing. A lot of people don't like to talk about funds. I do, I think, low because of my background, but I also look at the funds, they're like the big elephant in the room. They got big feet, <coughs> and they dance, and they're dancing in, and they're dancing out. If we're not sure where they're going, we can be squashed by it. So we just have to make sure we understand where they're going and where they're coming back, where they're, where, whether they're coming in or going out. This shows just in relation to corn. But you can see here, this, this black line is the market. The green line up here, that's that index fund. And then the red lines are the hedge funds. The blue lines at the bottom are commercial, so those are your elevators. So they're always short. Hedge funds can be long or short. You can see they were short here back in March of 2000. They were short. But you can see the flow of the market along with as investment money comes in and investment money goes out. So it's good to watch that and see that. And you can see that we've been losing investment money here recently. Um, Companies like uh, Barclays have come out and said, we're not going to invest in the commodity markets anymore. We're out of that. We're not going to do it. Um, because now it's becoming a political thing to some cases, to some, some degrees, because of the, um, well, if you're involved in investing in a commodity that could drive up the cost of food, it doesn't look good from a public relations standpoint. So you're starting to see some banks look at that and start to question that. And they were one of them that came out. Now, there were other reasons, but I think that was one of the underlying reasons as well. I don't know if this will play. Will play? It's not going to play. All right. Ben Bernanke, ben Bernanke is a child, and that little child is picking up money out of a basket and throwing it out the window. It's funny when it works. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the dollar, um, real quick on the dollar. I put the dollar chart up here because there used to be a correlation of the dollar, oil, and corn, or commodities. Right? You look at corn. We used to always, you could always, you could always know where the corn market was going in the morning before it opened when it used to open at nine thirty. If you looked at what the dollar was doing, so we had low dollar, high oil. What's corn doing? It's going up. That correlation has disappeared over the last two and a half three years. It has disappeared. I think we'll see us come back to that. 
I think we'll see it start to come back to more fundamentals as we start seeing some of the hedge funds and those funds leave. We'll start coming to a more of a normalcy of a marketplace. Not saying there'll be less volatility. It just, it just will, we'll start to look at these types of things. Um, this is going to sound crazy, especially after hearing uh, the past presenter, uh, Dr. Young, but I do think we're we going to see strength in the dollar. We can see mid 80s in the dollar. Um, I know that's. Uh, it's not the, the most exciting thing, but I do think that there is a, there is opportunity for strength in the dollar. And some people will say, how can you say that? Does anybody know what our national debt's going to be by the end of this year? Projected to be? 18.3 trillion. It's roughly where they're at right now. Well, that's not that so with that being said, um, you know, people are like, well, but the, the why I say there's still going to be strength in dollars because we're still one of the strongest, if not the strongest economic engine in the world. Um, I know that people, there's China out there and they've got more cash than that, but do you trust China? So if I'm an investor, if I'm investing in currencies or if I believe in currencies, I'm going to go to the dollar because of reliability and because of the structure. And so, and, and that's kind of my, my story on the dollar. Um, I'm not going to touch on these too long, but we did have the drought, everybody knows. Um, I like to look at these maps. This was the last day of December. They're, they're soil moisture maps. Last day of December. <clears throat> you can see where you guys are. Red. Right? Right here. Um, and you can see Illinois. This was the last day of December. <coughs> this is as of today. Well, February 22nd. So you can see what's happening is Illinois, from a soil moisture standpoint, we're starting to replenish some of that moisture in the soil. It's not as red in this area. We're not completely out of the drought. I know it's dry in a lot of areas still, but we're starting to look at that. We're starting to talk about that. Why I bring it up is because from a risk management standpoint, you are going to see spikes in this market because of maps like this. You are going to see downturns in the market because of maps like this. Because somebody will say, hey, drought's over. Illinois, drought's over. It's all done, said and done. We're going to start investing, or we're going to sell off, or so you're going to start to see this. So watch those. Take advantage of them. Take advantage of the spikes as the market spikes. If you're in Missouri, you know as you uh, as you as you have improved. Let me see if I can go back. So as you have improved, as this area starts to improve even more, that talk will even become stronger. But it's not even going to. It's not going to make a difference. From a, from a market standpoint, when you look at the market and how it reacts to news and information, we will probably have stories out that will kill our crop at least once or twice. Or if we do all of a sudden get this rain and the weather patterns come through and we're starting to get all the rain, it's going to even be better. The market will spike because we're not going to be able to get the crop in the ground. When have we never been able to truly get the crop in the ground as a nation? But when that story will start, so you'll start to see that market will take off. I say that is when the market takes off, take advantage of it. Because if we have that big crop, the market price is going to lower. <coughs> Can anybody imagine walking out and looking at that? Isn't that amazing? I just put that in there. I just Did anybody see the special, the PBS special on that? A couple of you. When the lady said, you know, we walked out and my mom just told me to come inside and pray because she thought the world was ending. We don't see anything like that. So. We talked about it being dry, and it was dry, but and it is dry out west still. But yeah. cattle inventory as of January one, cattle inventory is going down. Right, we're we're losing record number of, of, of herds that have been liquidated, both in dairy as well as in, in beef. That's uh, that's continuing, um, and, and and you know what surprises me is that we didn't see more of that as input costs went so high that we didn't see more of that. I think we will see a little bit more liquidation, but we'll see a stable, stable, a stabilization in that, especially if, um, if if corn prices do go down. So I didn't ask this question earlier, but who wants corn prices to go down? <laughs> okay, all right. I should ask that question earlier. <laughs> so for you guys in the room, <laughs> corn prices very possibly could go could go down. Um, and, and take advantage of that. So it's the exact opposite. So if you have feed needs, take advantage of the dips. So when you hear the bearish stories and the bearish news, fill your need on those dips. Take advantage of the same type of marketing strategies 
that we were talking about from a producer selling standpoint from your buying needs. It works the same, just an opposite, just a different structure. But. Uh, feeder cattle. Feeder cattle has actually started to increase a little bit, so we're starting to see that, but you can see the dramatic drop off that we've had. Uh, now, you know, I think looking at this from a slaughter standpoint, because if you talk about slaughter and you look at it, that has started to decrease. There still is very, not, there's slightly negative margins in the packing industry still, about 50, 60 in the red per head, so you're starting to see that issue still, and that's becoming, that's better than what it was, but it's still, uh, it's still an issue. So, um, you know, the average, we watched this, you can see this is where it was, you can see we've had a, an increase and we're starting to dip down a little bit. Um, our exports, our exports need to increase, and I think we will see an increase um, in the exports. I think that will come, um, but you can see this is just based off of, of country and where they are. It's a really busy chart. I just put it up there because I think from an export standpoint right now, we've got, we kind of have a little bit of a demand issue, especially when we talk about uh, January, and you look at what happened, everybody knows what happened in January, right? Who gets a regular paycheck, what happened in January? Your Social Security taxes increased to 2%. So that all of a sudden started to shut down people going out to eat sorry, because of the hit, or at least that was what was expected, you know, to start talking about that. So demand for beef um, started to decline a little bit. But I think we'll see a, pro a, a solid uh, increase in exports going forward. Uh, this is our per capita meat consumption. And you can see where is our beef. So you can kind of see where we're at right now, but it's interesting. Turkey's pretty much stayed flat. You can see here's your uh, here's your red meat poultry. Really spiked and then took a took a dip here recently. Overall, I think I said this earlier. Overall, I think cattle prices will be around the 120 to 129 level. I think that's where they'll, they'll remain. Um, I know the USDA has to pay about 129 this year. Right? I, I think they're they're right on the mark. Um, acres real quick, because I know I'm running out of time. Acres real quick, CRP acres. Uh, everybody talks about where the acres coming from. I didn't touch on this earlier, but we're taking 2.6 million acres out of CRP this year, and we've taken 9.9 .9 million since 2007. So that's the other area where some of those acres are coming from. Are they, are they great acres? Probably not. They're marginal acres. Everywhere I talk, they're marginal acres. Is that going to bring the average up or down? It's going to bring it down, right? So. So if people ask me, well, I think we'll get the 160, we'll get the 166 average that we'll hit trend yield because we haven't hit it in the last three years. We're not going to hit it because a lot of the added acres or marginal acres are trying to drive that down. Let's look at talk about soybeans. Looking at soybeans, um, you know, right now we're carrying soybeans ending stocks in the 2012-13 is at 125. Um, that's tight. It's very tight, and you can see that we are uh, we're on pace to well, well, we're on we're on pace that if, if exports continue, the pace they're at right now, we will be depleted by May if they continue. China continues to come in and buy, and they tend to come in and cancel, and they come in and buy, and they come in and cancel. So it's one of those where we may not know we're out of beans until July, but it'll happen if they if they continue to do that. But one of the reasons why the bean market fell pretty dramatically after the last USDA report had to do with the export number. Everybody thought that export number was going to increase because we're already at 95% of where the USDA has its peg in exports. So that's, that's one of the, the issues. So the thought is, is our exports were already over that number, and so that number should be less. When it wasn't, the trade looked at it as a bearish number. That's what sold off the bean market. Um, looking at this data here, I must have put that in. Okay, let's do this. So let's switch to corn for a minute. Looking at corn, this dashed line here, this gray line, is actually the uh, projected 2012-2013 export number. The black line is where we're at. Every week we disappoint in exports. Every single week. That's representative of a 900 million bushel export. And we're not on pace to hit that. And that just kind of shows that. 
This was the grind. I kind of touched on the ethanol earlier, but this is the grind chart that I was talking about. And so these blue dot, this blue line is touching on all of the uh, ethanol and where we're. Uh, this is weekly grind numbers is what this is. This red line, we need to be at or above this red line every time in order to uh, in order to meet the USDA's demand. This was last year's that green. Look at the difference between last year and this year. Okay, so let's look at corn variations. I don't have 120 on here. <laughs> so I apologize for that. But I uh, I do I do like to show this chart because I think it's important to look at. If we look at the new crop and what could happen, this is kind of the middle of the road here. But if we have a 155 bushel per acre in our feed and our, our exports and our ethanol and all those demands kind of come in line of where the USDA has them pegged, we could still have a two point well two billion bushel per acre. Now if you slide down the scale, all these numbers staying the same. You get to this 140 and you're looking at 732. Or if we did hit trade yield, 3 billion bushels to carry. You'd be happy. <laughs> but, you know, and obviously it, it's, it's interesting to look at this, and yeah, you can say that, and that's more of a shock and awe factor because if we had 166 trend yield, the price of corn would be close to $4, if not lower than that. Export numbers would be higher, feed would be higher, ethanol would pump at full capacity. So now you're starting to throw all those demand in there, and now the price is going to increase a little bit, and that overall carry comes down. So you got to look at all of those factors. But you'll see these numbers, and as you listen to other guys like me stand up and talk, you'll see some folks will stand on that and say that that's what it is. That's what we're going to have, folks. That's what we're going to have. But it's just nice to have a chart that just kind of a sliding scale that you can look at. Any questions or comments on that? Yes, sir. Is there any importing of corn from South America? To, mm -hmm. I read that there was a company in South Carolina or something importing corn. There has been corn that's been imported in the United States because the cost of corn to import it was cheaper than it was to buy it. There's been a few cases of that. It's not widespread, but it, 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 it has happened. And, and it could continue to happen. I mean, you'll start to see that. South America has plenty of corn. So we could certainly continue to happen. So the prospects of us running out of corn is probably zero. My personal belief in traveling and talking to other farmers, yes. It's, it's, it might, I don't think that there's an opportunity to run out of corn in the United States. I think there's more corn here. And I think with the, the exports and the demand numbers and all of that, you'll see that. Now, I know from a livestock standpoint, too, if you talk about it and you look at, at um, the ethanol, we grind less corn for ethanol, we have less DDGs. So now instead of feeding cheap DDGs, now you've got to feed corn. So that's where the USDA took 200 million and dropped that in the feed side. Last last time on the report, or right, so been, what is this? This is February, so it was the January report they did that. That was standing compensate for that. So, you know, so, but yeah, we're not going to run We will not run out of Certain areas will, and I know there's areas in Missouri that have, Southern Illinois, I know that there are. Um, Southern Illinois, there was an area that, uh, about seven county area that averaged eight bushel to the acre. So, I mean, those are, so, so that area is, is to please. Um, looking at, at this, this is just kind of another recap. But that carry right now, they've got it 632 in corn. And you can see that with those numbers, we're not hitting this 4.5. We're not hitting the, uh, we're not hitting the export numbers, so that can certainly increase. So, okay. Let's, uh, Let's wrap, I want to, I'll wrap up here. I want to wrap up with South America, because the talk is on South America. And real quick, I want to tell stories. Anybody been to South America? Okay, so you folks who raise your hand, correct me if I'm incorrect on this. I've never been to South America, but I was talking to somebody who was, and he told me a really interesting story about, uh, he was there, he was with his translator. They were on a farm, and the guy was packing up. It was like packing, so the, the guy told, are they going on vacation? He said, oh no, no, no vacation. He's actually going to, uh, they're actually going to go deliver some grain. So, oh, okay. Well, why is he packing so much? Well, he's taking his three kids and his wife. Okay. How long are they going to be gone? A week. Okay. Well, how much grain is he delivering? A thousand bushels of beans. How could you imagine delivering that? First of all, could you imagine I have three girls and a wife at home? I would not want to be in a truck. With them for a week. Delivery. I love them, but I would not be in the truck with them for a week. 
So you get that. Um, but so logistically, production-wise, they are going to meet. They're about 83 million metric ton. I have 82 and a half here. They've actually increased that. So with all the weather concerns and all the weather issues, the government has actually increased in Brazil what they're going to have from a soybean standpoint. Argentina, same thing, 54 million metric ton. Uh, Brazil, 71 in corn. Their goal is to get to 100. And then you've got 28 in uh, Argentina. So looking at this, the big question is logistics. This railroad is in Brazil. There is a north-south railroad in Brazil that they are, it's almost complete, but not quite. Um, it runs from the northern part all the way down right outside of that Mato Grosso area. This is a huge bean growing area in there. Obviously, it's where a lot of the beans come from. So it will cut down on transportation. What they're proposing is an east-west from here to their biggest port right here. That's what these blue line represents. This is what's been proposed to do that over the next 30 years. So and here is just the, here's the port that it's brought into. Um, so they do have that. So from a logistics standpoint, not right now. They don't have it because if you're in Monte Grosso and you want to deliver beans, it's like getting in your car. Well, it's 928 miles. So if you think about it on the East Coast, think of like where Penn State is, State College. I'm a U of I fan, but I was at State College, so I had to use this as an example, so it's one I remember. You start at State College and go to Jacksonville, Florida. That's, that's the, basically the distance that they drive to deliver a thousand bushels. Here is the ports. Here's the port. This is a picture. If you just go on the internet, go to marine, uh, marine, marine, uh, what is it? Marine traffic. Marine traffic.com. You can look at any port in the world and see almost like a Google map of it. And these green dots in here, those are vessels waiting in the port for 45, 50 days that are waiting for the grain to get here because there's such a demand. So right now, logistically, they can't meet it, so I think they'll come back. They're stacking up each week about 2 million metric tons of additional cargo show up in the vessel in the port every single week waiting to be loaded. Okay, well, I'll end with this. Because no matter what I told you, or what I've said, follow the green van, no matter what I've said or what I tell you, it's never going to be this bad. We're talking about risk. And you can see this is in New York City. In this wrecking wall, there are no barricades. Actually, there are. I used to say there are no barricades, but if you look right here where these guys are walking in front of, those are barricades, but I guess they forgot to pull them out. So that van wasn't doing anything wrong and, and just got, uh, got, uh, got crushed. So I always like to say that before I talk about prices, just real quick, uh, my opinion on, on corn and beans, corn will stay about $4.50 to $6. Bean new crop about $12 to $13.75 is the range. I give ranges because of the volatility in the market, and it's going to depend on weather. So keep in mind the demand destruction in corn. Beans demand is still very strong. The weather in the Midwest is going to play a huge role, and South America needs to ramp up their exports in order to meet demand. Otherwise, that demand is going to come back to us here in the United States. And that's me on a tractor. <laughs> All right, anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. You didn't mention anything about wheat. Uh, in what effect do you think the increased acreage of wheat, barley, and so on is going to have on the corn market? Well, you know, we've seen a dramatic drop in wheat prices. <laughs> uh, wheat from $9 down to close to $7. I don't know where it is this morning, but it's really fallen hard. And I think that could have a huge impact in, in the demand side of corn uh, from a feed standpoint. If, if we can get wheat prices down, there's an abundance of it. There's a lot of wheat worldwide right now. And the thought is it's going to get bigger. I know they're talking about weather issues in the Ukraine and in those places regarding wheat. And I know in Russia they've had some issues. But I think overall we're going to have a very nice and very large wheat crop. And I think uh, it will have uh, an impact on the demand usage for our corn because I think you'll see wheat demand pick up for that reason. that answer your question? And I'm sorry, I had this wheat slides up here, but I knew I was cutting on time, so I have to through. Any other questions?
for corn and soybean growers that are looking for some price protection, how do you feel about the short dated put option now? You know, I I like the short dated put options. I think they're a good. I think they're a good strategy. I wouldn't do everything in short dated options. You know where they got that from? Um, a lot of people like talk about but the derivatives, the derivative market, the over the counter market is what really started the CME to start doing that. Um, because you know, in an over the counter market, you can basically pick any expiration month you want, and so they had to compete with that. So that's where they started to throw that in. So we use those. I don't use the short dated. I can never use short dated options because I use the over the counter side. So, but it's the same amount. So I, they're good. They're good products. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Interest rates, uh, long term, short term, and timing. <laughs> can, I, can I defer? Um, I, you know, I think right now because of the size of our debt and because of the cost that it would increase if we saw an increase in interest rates, what it would do to our budgets and what it would do to our, our, our spending from a government standpoint, I think we'll see interest rates remain low for at least the next couple of years. I think they've come out and said no real rate increases through 2015. Is that right? What the Fed came out and said something along those lines. So, and that's about as long. That's kind of like my weather model. I won't look at a weather model the past seven days. So I, I, there's just too many variables out there really to answer the question. So I'm going to 